Well, thank you all for joining us. As you know, this is a Caribou Interactions core event led in part by some of the people who have been with what we call the Urinary Microbiome Research Interest Group of Caribou. And a lot of you have been involved in discussions, which we've had for almost, well, for two years now. We've had ongoing discussions virtually among investigators looking at infection in the lower urinary tract and microbiome. And then I want to give a special shout out to Michael Nugent and Nicole Denisco, who are both at UT Dallas, both scientists in the area of urinary microbiome, who really helped pull this together. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the Friday series, the Friday afternoon series that's, that's going to be coming up next month and throughout next year, where we really want to exchange knowledge between scientists who are doing different things in the urinary microbiome and because we realize that exchanging knowledge is the basis for collaboration and for understanding each other and as scientists i can speak for myself there's never enough time to do that so we need conscious forces to create those opportunities and that's really kind of what the caribou interactions core does so those of you who are not familiar the caribou community is made up of investigators and trainees from around the country who are involved in urinary work, urinary research in various areas, bladder, prostate, kidney, and um, all are united by a collaborative minded spirit and a willingness to contribute to science and, and build the next generation of researchers in this area. So mostly Caribou is comprised of centers that are funded by the NIDDK to do urologic research, but increasingly we are attracting more people who want to just be involved, be part of these events, and eventually potentially some collaborative work as well. So this event comes as a part two, so to speak, of an event that we had earlier this summer. And what happened was the Caribou Interactions Corps was uh, developed a relationship with some patients who have UTI and similar type experiences. And I met one of these people, Laura Helgeson, at a meeting of urinary microbiome research in California. And she approached me with her newly formed group, the UTI Health Alliance, and said, hey, we're a bunch of patients and we wanna learn more about the science and we wanna, we wanna talk to clinicians and investigators and tell them what's, what we think and what's going on. And this really fits with directives from the NIH, Department of Defense and other funding agencies, which are increasingly saying, researchers, talk to patients, see what they find interesting and see what's important to them. And of course, clinicians and patients have long had a relationship and not always maybe getting the time to talk and exchange knowledge as they should. So the first event we had was patients talking to us. And I'll tell you, when we recorded that event and put it on our Caribou YouTube page, I think it's the most watched video we've ever had. And we've had some reports that some investigators who like are involved in training or student teaching or you know teaching are actually using that in their curricula. So uh, it's gonna it's gonna have long legs, I think. And it was really kind of the start of a what we hope to be a burgeoning and growing relationship with patients. Um, we're learning about how to relate to patients, and so we are uh, in this together. So thanks to Laura and all of her colleagues and patients who spoke to us. Today, we're going to hear from investigators and clinicians and clinician scientists, and we're going to learn about what they're doing. Each of these three panelists is going to take about 10 minutes to talk about what they do, to tell you kind of what their primary uh, area of interest is. And then we collected a bunch of questions and concerns and frustrations that the patients articulated at the June meeting, and we've collected those. And Dr. Nugent will then run a discussion after the three panelists are done that can address some of those questions. We'll throw it open to the panelists and to any others on the call and to new comments and questions that come up. And again, this is just the very beginning of what we hope to be a, a long collaborative relationship. So without further ado, um, I'm Chris Penniston and my staff from the Caribou Inter Interactions Corps is here, Mariana Coughlin and Jennifer Almaris. They're instrumental in keeping things organized and keeping things running. So I will announce the three panelists very briefly. They're each gonna take about 10 minutes to talk to you about themselves and then Dr. Nugent will take over. First, we'll hear from Eva Raphael. She's a physician of um, assistant professor of epidemiology and biostatistics and family and community medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. She was a K-12 scholar. I believe she just completed that and is on her way to becoming a funded independent investigator, both a clinician and scientist. We'll hear from her first. 
and she, she'll tell you about her particular interests in this area. And then we'll hear from Dr. Nicole Danisco, who's an assistant professor and scientist of biological sciences at University of Texas, Dallas. She's got a long history and uh, is a rising star in the science field with respect to urinary microbiome and has some unique experiences. And Dr. Michael Nugent is her postdoc and he'll be leading the discussion later. And finally, we'll hear from Sonali Admani. She's a physician of medicine at Duke University. She is a K-12 scholar, which is a very prestigious award that both she and Eva has, have received. And uh, she's being mentored by a group of stellar leaders at Duke. And she's a, an infectious disease specialist and is both a clinician and a scientist and has some really unique insights to share. So with, for, without further ado, we'll start with Eva and then after Eva, Nicole, and then Sonali. Great, so thank you so much for inviting me to be on this panel. I'm very excited to participate in this conversation and hear um, the other panelists take on UTIs. Um, so my work focuses on community onset uh, urinary tract infections using various methods that include molecular microbiology, social and spatial epidemiology. Um, so this work kind of started when I was uh, a fellow uh, before I was on the K-12 where we were interested, and so just to, why am I talking about ESBL? Because our work does focus on drug resistance. Um, but so we started a, a project looking at just the local antibiograms from uh, the San Francisco General Hospital, UCSF, the VA, and Laguna Honda, which is the, the largest skilled nursing facility. And we were interested to see if trends in ESBL producing E. coli causing bacteria, um, well, both bacteria and non-urine samples, if there had been any change over time. Because we, you know, we, we keep hearing reports that drug resistance is increasing worldwide. The interest was, well, is it in increasing locally as well? And um, we did find that there were significant increases in uh, trends in ESBL E. coli, uh, both from urine and non-urine samples from the San Francisco General Hospital or the, the county hospital, as you can see in, in blue, um, and from the VA hospital in, in urine samples. Um, but, you know, these antibiograms combine inpatient and outpatient, and we actually were interested to know, is, is are those increases happening because of uh, inpatient trends, uh, which would be potentially f f feasible? Or is this also happening in community settings where uh, antibiotic use is perhaps, uh, while it is heavily used, it's less so than in inpatient settings? So we collected data from the electronic health records from uh, the San Francisco General Hospital and uh, its associated clinics and found that uh, actually ESBL producing E. coli bacteria episodes increased um, each year, both in community and uh, both for community onset and uh, healthcare onset bacteria. Um, we also found that there were certain patient demographic characteristics which were associated with having uh, bacteria caused by ESBL producing E. coli. And so for community onset um, events, age over 65, uh, male gender, and identifying as uh, Latine was associated with, um, with having uh, such resistance types. For healthcare onset associated bacteria, male gender was really the only uh, significant um, uh, 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 variable. We were also interested uh, to know if um, there are, si since there's a lot of data out there that actually supports the idea that urine drug resistant UT UTIs might actually be driven by common source exposures uh, like food, we were, we were curious to see if we would find any sort of uh, spatial clusters of uh, drug resistant E. coli um, causing bacteria events um, in San Francisco. And, and we did find um, clusters of ESBL producing uh, E. coli, um, but those were actually um, explained by recurrent episodes in the same individual. Um, so as I mentioned, we found spatial clusters at the episode level, partially explained by recurrent uh, episodes. Um, what we also found is that, as others have found, is that an initial drug resistant bacteria episode specifically with ESBL was more likely to be followed by ESBL producing E. coli uh, episodes as well. 
um, which is not surprising, but w we found a pretty a pretty strong evidence for in, in our in our data. Um, we have work where we're also collecting urine isolates. So we have a collection of urine isolates which we have uh, genotyped using PCR-based methods. We will be doing whole genome sequencing at some point in the very, very near future. Um, but we have a collection of isolates which we um, which we conducted in 2019 and have restarted in 2022 going forward. Um, and we have found essentially that the distribution of pandemic genotypes that make up about 50% of uh, UTI um, caused by E. coli are made up of these four. So there are four genotypes that are just commonly causing um, these uh, these infections. And so between 2019 and 2022, the, the distribution of these genotypes hasn't changed very much. We actually have obtained more data. So this slide should, should be Did she just freeze? Collection that those uh, prevalences have not changed, um, but we have ongoing um, analyses where we will be determining if there are patient demographic characteristics associated with uh, having an infection by a specific genotype. Um, and like I mentioned, we will be sending uh, samples for whole genome sequencing to see if there are any phylogenetic clusters. Um, I think that in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip over the la that last slide. Uh, but just to finish with uh, a study that we actually have just sent out for publication today, we will see if it we'll see what comments we get. Um, but we conducted similar analyses uh, trying to see if there are any spatial clusters of genotypes. Because of course, ESBL E. coli, it's, although ST131 most likely um, is the genotype associated with ESBL production, there are other genotypes and they might be so widespread throughout the city that we may not actually find any spatial clusters. There may be multiple mini outbreaks. Whereas here with this collection in 2019, which was just over a f um, four, about four months, um, we actually did find clusters of uh, all the genotypes except for ST73, where we found hotspots of ST131, ST95, which is less likely to be resistant, and ST69. Um, again, potentially pointing to local common source exposures. Um, so this is the scope of my work, uh, led by, I should have added many more people on this slide. I will change my acknowledgements. Um, but, uh, yeah, this is, this is what I do. Uh, before we go on to Nicole, I just want to ask a question and I'm a relative novice in the area of urinary microbiome, but ESBL, as I recall, refers to some kind of an enzyme that these certain bacteria produce. Yes. Make them what hard to kill <laughs> yes yes i i apologize for kind of glossing over but esbl stands for extended spectrum beta lactamase and so these bacteria produce an enzyme that essentially cuts the beta lactam ring of uh cephalospore and you know of beta lactam antibiotics and so uh that essentially enabling them not to be killed by uh by third generation cephalosporins. Um, but, you know, ESBL production is also defined by uh, susceptibility to clavulanic acid. And so once you add that into the mix, the organism does become susceptible, but it is a harder to treat uh, infection. So uh, someone coming in with an ESBL producing E. coli uh, bacteria, you know, UT with a UTI caused by that organism, you know, will have to be treated with broader spectrum antibiotics. I've even had some patients have to be treated with IV antibiotics, having to come in on a daily basis for a week to to receive, um, you know, ceftriaxone. I, no, sorry, but, I'm sorry. But I'm this sorry. type of Very genetic, dependent. but this type of bacteria can't be detected in a typical clinical assay, only in a research setting, probably, or no? No, no. So they are detected in by clinical microbiology okay. labs. They are reported on, which is why we were able to use electronic health records to identify them. Got it. Yes. Okay. Thank you. As you know, urine culture data comes two days later after you send a urine culture. So there's a lag time, which is why there may be some interest to know who might be at a higher risk. 
Got it. All right, Nicole. Okay, so my lab, um, we we study recurrent UTI. That's kind of our focus, um, and we specifically study it in postmenopausal women. And this is partially because the clinician who I work with very closely, that's the main demographic he sees. But also, they are you know very disproportionately affected by UTI. Um, we see increases in UTI susceptibility after menopause. Um, and there's really a kind of a lack of research uh, in, in this in this group of, of women um, who are no longer of childbearing age, et cetera. So we wanted to, you know, pay attention to, to, to those women and, and see um, what might be uh, underlying their increased susceptibility to urinary tract infection and what kinds of therapies can we think of in order to, um, you know, better treat them. And so my background as a scientist um, is not necessarily in the UTI field, at least my PhD training was um, in a symbiosis between a bacterium and a plant that helps it to not need fertilizer. Uh, but I went into, I've always been very interested in understanding how microbes interact with their hosts. Uh, and when the opportunity presented itself to, um, to really start my own independent lab working on this problem, I jumped at it because I myself have had UTI. Uh, I actually uh, shared at the patient session that I actually almost died of an episode of pyelonephritis. So I understand our kidney infection uh, that turned septic. So, um, you know, it's, I think it just kind of felt like the right thing for me to do to, uh, to kind of dedicate my lab's work to, to adding knowledge to this problem and to hopefully devising some new solutions. So my first work in this, uh, realm was really um, what got me interested in the urinary microbiome field, which is where a lot of our lab's work um, is, is centered on. And this is because we um, got biopsies uh, from my wonderful clinical collaborator, Dr. Philippe Zimmern, that were, um, you know, from women that were undergoing a procedure uh, called fulguration, um, and specifically of a a region in their bladder where there was suspected to be infection. And so he will go in and cauterize those regions. Uh, and this is a last resort therapy for those women who have had recurrent UTI for a very long time. Uh, and, uh, and their next option is to have a cystectomy, which uh, is going to drastically lower quality of life. Uh, and so we were actually able to take biopsies, uh, you know, uh, these women grace, graciously consented to, to, to give us these. So we could study um, if there were bacteria that were actually embedded in the bladder. So one of the theories of how recurrent UTI works is that there's actually bacteria that are in the bladder and that aren't removed by antibiotic therapy. So we took those biopsies and then I devised a method to actually visualize the bacteria regardless of their species within the biopsy so we can see any bacteria. So whether they're, um, you know, a, a known bad bacteria like E. coli you don't want in your bladder, or maybe they're a good one, we don't know. We can just see any bacteria. And so what you see here in this picture is one of the results that we had where you can see all the bacteria in green. Um, and you can see them in different layers. So in this black region here, that's actually what we call the lumen of the bladder. So it's where the urine is going to be, right? Uh, and so we can see bacteria there. Uh, and we can see, trying to get my laser pointer going. Okay, cool. We can see bacteria there. We can also see them in what we call the epithelium. So it's that first layer of tissue that's going to be um, that's going to be facing the urine. And that's where we kind of expected um, at least bad bacteria to be and also in the in the lumen. But surprisingly, we found them actually very deep in the tissue. So in deeper and deeper layers uh, below this, this, this more surface facing tissue. And so that was really quite surprising to find that the bacteria could embed themselves so deep 
deeply within the in the bladders. And why that's important is because in these areas, most antibiotics can't reach them. So uh, we're not necessarily, maybe patients are getting recurring UTI because we can't actually clear out all the bacteria with the antibiotics we're using because they can't penetrate the this the cell layer here and they can't get out these bacteria that are right here. Um, and so, you know, we this was a, you know, a very exciting uh, finding, but also, I mean, not very good for, for these patients. But uh, our idea, at least the clinician I work with, his idea for the fulguration procedure is that he's physically removing these tissues that contain bacteria, and hopefully he can reset the environment. But we don't, that's a last resort procedure that is a, a surgical procedure. We don't want to, you know, have patients have to go through that. So um, we need new therapies that can maybe help prevent this or can help address this. So these are just kind of some areas of research in my lab right now. Uh, we do have a large focus on the urinary microbiome. We're looking at the structure, like what who's there in the microbiome or in the microbiomes of individuals of different uh, in different stages of health and, and disease and how do they change over time and we're interested in the role of the urinary microbiome in the susceptibility to recurring UTI uh, we also, we get a lot of bacteria in the lab. And so my graduate students have been uh, working with some less well-characterized types of bacteria that cause UTI and finding new ways that they can make us sick. And if we can figure out how they can make us sick, maybe we can figure out a way to target them better. Uh, and then uh, I think addressing, you know, more of the patient needs at least are, and this is why I, the research in my lab I consider to be translational because we do very basic science stuff, but we also are, are working on the translational side directly with clinicians and engineers to try to build some, some tools or, or new therapies that can actually help in the realm of therapeutics. Um, so we're working on um, on improving uh, existing ideas for whole cell vaccines uh, and in thinking about how we can make um, a potential probiotic therapy work better. And that kind of ties into our basic knowledge of the urinary microbiome and, and how it exists. And then we're working with engineers and trying to develop improved UTI diagnostics. So this is kind of like two parts because we need to uh, identify better markers. And this is point of care, meaning that it's something that we can get a result in within five or 10 minutes. So it can happen in, at the time of, of care and it can be a simple to use device, which is why we need to bring in engineers to um, actually develop these, these devices that can make accurate measurements and, and have an easy uh, output that's easy for clinicians to read and easy, we hope one day to actually make an at-home test uh, that, that can be used. But in order to do that, we also have to discover what what are good indicators of, of UTI that are not, that are culture independent so that they won't take, you know, uh, one to two days to actually get a result. Uh, and, and can this be used in like a triage manner so we can see if patients need further testing for antimicrobial susceptibility, uh, or if maybe they have a condition that might not be UTI or have, but have similar um, symptoms or, or, or presentation. So that's what we're working on. And you know, I'm happy to take any feedback um, from from patients and stuff about what they think might be important or, or not. But uh, yeah, we're we're trying to to do our our thing and, and help out. <laughs> um, thanks. This is the last time I'll sneak in, and then Dr. Nugent's going to take over. But that was just so cool because Eva started with like the community sort of look, and then we went deep into the bladder now with Nicole. And I think Sonali's talk, which is be an interesting kind of combination between the two. She's also a clinician scientist, as is Eva. So wonderful talk. Um, and go ahead, Sonali. Thank you. Uh, well, I want to thank everyone for being here, as well as um, thanks to Caribou and NIDDK for these opportunities to um, collaborate with other researchers, patients, um, and find find some time to get feedback in a way that we don't normally get feedback. So this could be a very interesting collaborative effort that we could do in the future. Um, to give you a little bit of background about me, um, I am an infectious disease physician and a healthcare epidemiologist. Most of my work has focused on um, you know, appropriate use of antibiotics. And I designed um, a lot of large health system as well as multi-hospital programs to reduce inappropriate antimicrobial use or antibiotic use for UTIs. 
And as I was designing these, these different programs, I started to realize that um, there were nuances to patients that, you know, when I start, when you develop these large scale um, fits all kind of criteria, they may not apply to all patients. So I've started to delve more into understanding um, how patients that come in with suspected UTI present. Um, so I wanted to highlight um, for the group, how do we, or our guidelines and clinicians, how are we generally categorizing patients that come to us either with UTI symptoms or with suspicion for UTI, or they have a positive culture? We have been taught to have three categories in our heads. And most of our guidelines, infectious disease, urology, geriatrics, tell us to put patients in three boxes. So you either don't have a UTI, you have no symptoms in a negative urine culture, or on the other end, you have a UTI because you have burning, you have urgency, and you have a positive urine culture. But if you have a positive urine culture and you don't have these symptoms, you have asymptomatic bacteriuria. Um, and it seems pretty clear cut. So when, when you're going through training, you're like, well, this is simple, you know, but what ends up happening in real life is um, I wanted to highlight this because someone um, retweeted this from our caribou postings. Um, and I was very touched by, by seeing this because um, I wanted to highlight what has happened from this approach of categorizing patients in three boxes is now in even infectious disease clinicians believe in this all or none phenomenon. And what people have started to say, and again, I'm not in any way picking on someone, I'm trying to share the challenges that people face when they're, when they're trained in this way, is that here uh, a clinician says they don't care about the urine culture result. You know, on one end, we're developing all these diagnostics, we're developing all these, um, you know, biomarkers, but then there's clinicians that say, we won't look at those things. We won't look at urine analysis. We won't look at bacteria. We won't look at growth on culture. We only care about symptoms. Everything else is asymptomatic bacteriuria. I bring this because it's important to first as we develop these biomarkers and, and point of care diagnostics, we need to start thinking about how do we change our, our communication and narrative. Um, so I wanted to highlight what I've seen as an infectious disease clinician for patients that, you know, don't fit into these criteria. So 80-year-old woman comes in with a one-week history of worsening incontinence, um, urine cultures show mixed flora, and it's so funny, I was on this call of experts and we could not decide what, whether worsening incontinence is a sign of a symptom of UTI or is it just there? And then what does mixed flora mean? Then there's another case. This has happened uh, to me a couple of months ago where a 30-year-old woman presents with a six-day history of worsening, burning or dysuria, urgency, low-grade fever, but urine cultures are negative. Then you have a 70-year-old man who comes in with confusion, low blood pressure, low-grade fever, and cannot give you symptoms because they have either dementia or delirium, and their urine culture is now growing greater than 100,000 uh, colonies of, let's say, E. coli, like we talked about earlier. These patients don't really fit into that those three clear-cut boxes that we always try to put people into. And... Um, I actually was at a conference for, um, again, infectious disease experts, and I, I used a Twitter poll. And I'm, I love showing these polls because it shows you what was happening in real time at the conference. And I asked people, how would you classify this 83-year-old with like low blood pressure, can't give you symptoms, has a little bit of fever, altered mental status, and grows E. coli? And most people said it would be a UTI, but you can see that there is confusion. Like some people said it's something else. Um, I also had this uh, amazing group of experts that came together and we went through multiple scenarios and we said, would you call this asymptomatic bacteriuria? Would you call this UTI? Would you call this something else? And so at least in like 20% of our cases, it was something else. And so are we at the point where we need to think beyond our three categories? And so I, what I've been working on, um, which is a, you know, a manuscript which is under review right now with the, one of the big journals is, is understanding that UTI is not a yes, no phenomenon. And it, it is something that may be on a spectrum or a continuum 
On one end to the left, you have patients that clearly don't have a UTI. Like today, I don't have a UTI. I know I don't have symptoms. I haven't checked a culture, admittedly. But being um, a female in her 30s, it's likely that I will have a negative urine culture. On the other end, there is someone who comes in with burning urgency frequency and has a positive urine culture, clear-cut UTI. As we mentioned earlier, we know asymptomatic bacteriuria is completely asymptomatic. That's right in the middle. But then as you can see here, I have a new category on the right and a known category on the left. So on the left of ASB, I have something called LUTs, which is lower urinary tract symptoms. Some women or men can have ongoing chronic lower urinary tract symptoms, like they can have an overactive bladder, they can have ongoing dis um, burning because of vaginal dryness, or there could be some other incontinence related issue um, I wanted to put it on this continuum because those patients can sometimes be inappropriately treated for a UTI or maybe dismissed because they have a negative urine culture. So they don't get the relief for the symptom because somebody still has to address the underlying symptom. And then here is the most interesting one, which has never been named before, um, but something that I'm trying to categorize is bacteriuria of unclear significance. This is like an, you know, your any patient who has atypical symptoms with a positive urine culture or someone who cannot express symptoms and has a positive urine culture. And the reason we need to categorize these patients is because by constantly labeling people as asymptomatic bacteriuria, we're dismissing that symptom that is causing them discomfort. And so my goal is. I'm not saying you need antibiotics, but I am saying I want to recognize that something is going on and it needs further workup. And so basically the two groups that I think often get ignored are the LUTs group and the BUS group, which is the bacteriuria of unclear significance. And these patients require additional workup. So we need to think about what is causing their symptoms. Maybe it may be an atypical UTI. We are actually seeing patients with atypical UTI. And sometimes I can't believe I'm saying that because it's so hard for me to prescribe antibiotics. But just uh, two weeks ago, I was called into the emergency department because I was on clinical service with a patient with end-stage dementia, cannot speak, cannot tell me anything. Like there's no way I can get a symptom. They have a positive urine culture. I can't even wake this person up enough to speak with me. And so what I ended up doing was doing a really good exam as I pressed on the lower belly the patient flinched. And that was enough of a sign for me that someone needed to come to the hospital, is having pain in their lower belly, has a positive urine culture, has a lot of white cells. So I wouldn't say that I don't care about these things. I do care about the fact that I'm seeing this scenario and I'm concerned that this patient was brought in for a change in mental status as well. So I wanted to bring some thoughts here for discussion um, and I can just kind of pull them up as we uh, quickly and then we can discuss them. So my general question when I talk to even clinicians is what should we focus on, labs, symptoms or both? And then how can we improve the diagnosis of UTI and related conditions? So I'm including like when I say UTI, I want to think about even bus and LUTs and everything that is happening in the urinary tract. And then what is the goal of treatment for patients, for caregivers, and for clinicians? And this is important because once we understand the goals of treatment, we start to think about what is it that I can give for relief? Like, is it the pain relief that's the goal of treatment? Is it the fear of being in sepsis? Or is it something else? And so it's most important. Um, one of the things we think about in it's one of the, the, the four M's of an age-friendly health system is what matters most. And so um, my goal from, from doing this work is, is to do shared decision-making with patients. So I want to find avenues to work with patients to find what matters most to them, identify their goals of treatment and improve the diagnosis of UTI. Um, I have a really good team of mentors and collaborators. I'll quickly highlight them here. They've they've all been uh, in some ways associated with Caribou. Um, and then I'll stop here for some questions. Well, um, my name is Michael. I'm Nicole Denisto's postdoc. We work on, we've been working together for about five years. 
And I want to lead a bit of a kind of discussion about these uh, the topics from our three uh, three presenters. I was just actually um, in a meeting with some graduate students, and I wanted to inform them that you know everyone's welcome to participate and ask questions, even if you feel like a question is not necessarily um, easy to ask. And um, and if you have any questions or anything, anything you want to put into the chat, I really invite you to do that. But I want to start with one of the, the questions that uh, the Caribou team has kind of curated from our previous events, especially following up after the last talk. And the question reads like this, patients understand that what they are experiencing is not a UTI, even though it may seem like it to them. So why isn't there more effort placed on better diagnostics or referrals to someone who can readily get into the etiology of the problem? Why is this issue that this patient is experiencing not elevated to the appropriate level of clinical care? And um, I'd like to kind of open that question up to um, Dr. Advani, um, because I feel like um, it kind of resonates with your talk. Yeah, no, well, thank you for that. And I, I, I think, I can answer one part of the talk, but I think the actual, um, you know, investment into diagnostics, one of the other collaborators, maybe Nicole can talk about that. Um, the challenge I think we've faced is this having this all or none approach to UTIs is assuming people either have UTIs or not. And um, most of our efforts have either been focused on saying, we don't need antibiotics or we need antibiotics. It's never been, you know, relieving what the patient is feeling or identifying what the patient is feeling, finding a middle ground. And I think some of it starts with mislabeling. I'm hoping that if uh, my research is accepted, that could be the first step to starting to say that it's not always UTI, not UTI. There is something in the middle. And sometimes those patients may need a different approach. It may be that they need a short course therapy, or they may need relief of symptoms. They may need someone to just observe them for a day or two. Um, and I think that would open up a full avenue of different treatment approaches. Um, there could be diagnostic markers that could help in those areas. So specifically in patients with bus or bacteriuria of unclear significance, are there specific biomarkers that could help us kind of delineate which one of them will progress to a UTI versus not. So I think there's definitely um, potential, but first thing is to recognize the problem. And that's what I'm trying to do is shed light on the problem. So I'll pause there. I know that um, around biomarkers, some of it may be also how much funding is, is devoted to UTIs, um, but I'll pass it on to Nicole. Yeah, I think, um you know, as we define these new categories, right, we'll need to have new ways to diagnose them. And I think, you know, our, as scientists, we are looking for things that are objective, right? We want to things that can be interpreted in an objective way. Uh, and, and, and that can, I think, um, complement the subjective, you know, often subjective nature of like a, a, a physician's relationship with their patient and, and, and their own own viewpoint. And, um, and yeah, so I think there, you know, is um, those two things need to come together, right, to, to give a full picture of what's going on, because, you know, we don't know how you're feeling, right? Um, but uh, if we can find like objective markers that 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 we can actually detect, and that will give like our ideas that will give you empower you to say, hey, I actually like you might not find the specific bacteria you're looking for in my urine, but I have this marker that's really associated with the a UTI, so there is something wrong here, right? So just don't send me home. And, uh, and then maybe if we know what that is, we could, you know, go back and find what might be causing that, that symptom, right? And then how do we treat that? But the issue is, is funding, right? Like we just, there's, um, it's difficult to be able to do this work because we're kind of all just fighting for scraps, really. It's what it feels like um, for uh, to be able to 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 get this this research done. I mean, um, and and we haven't really seen increases in, in in how research in general across the the country is is funded in 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 decades, right? So, 
um, it's it's been inflation has happened right so um, it, it, it it's difficult and I feel like a lot of times we feel like we're, we're trying our, our best right but it's good to focus us on areas where we can maybe make better use of the resources we have right but it's a challenge and it's very tough as a clinician because your bladder has like one way of telling you something's wrong. Like it gives you changes in sensation, but those aren't always associated with a quote unquote positive urine culture. Right. And I mean, I have patients that their symptoms happen before their positive urine culture happens. Like if I retest them three days later, it's positive And then it's very clear what's going on. But if you catch it early in the course, it's very different. And so I think point of care diagnostics that are sensitive, especially in the setting of symptoms and help direct treatment are much needed. The other thing is that overactive bladder feels a lot like a UTI, right? So there's this increased frequency and discomfort and other things. And we know from some of the research that has been done that it is associated with changes in the urinary microbiome, but we don't best know how to manipulate that to help with that particular condition. And right now, as it stands, overactive bladder is having all these symptoms basically of a UTI, but in the absence of a culture positive situation. And those cultures are tricky because they're geared towards basically E. coli and a few other bugs. So if your bug is something else, it may or may not be detected by a standard urine culture. So uh, kudos to Nicole for going after point of care, because I think like point of care testing where that it can help with that clinical decision making, making is, is greatly needed. So. Yeah. So there's a, um... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh no, I was just gonna add just a, a few a few comments. Like to bring it back even further, as a primary care physician, I can tell you the first thing that you wonder is: is this a vaginal infection? Is this a true cystitis? So there's even I think that even that like muddies the picture of you know what what are these urinary symptoms due to? So so that's just my comment as a as a clinician and as a researcher. I mean, what's what I there's been three papers that have I've come across in last week that I thought really kind of capture the nuance in, in what we're seeing here is and one of them actually followed women who had a higher who were at a higher risk of having recurrent UTIs and they obtained urine cultures from them uh for, I want to say maybe every day for like maybe a few weeks to a month up to the point where they got a, a re that, that recurrent UTI. And what they found is that what Sonali was pointing to, they essentially were like, there's, it seems like there is indeed the spectrum of presence of uh, bacteria in the urine and, you know, these kind of fluctuating uh, uh, symptoms. So I think that the more the more we're looking at what may be in the urine and associated with symptoms just sheds more sheds more light but at the same time i think leads to more questions um i'm just going to bring up this other paper which try to identify uh sort of profiles of urobiome as associated with asymptomatic bacteria or what we're calling asymptomatic bacteria um uh LUTs incontinence and you know what we can what we call a, a true UTI and they essentially were saying we can't really say that there's something special about you know a microbiome profile and associated symptoms. So I just feel like the more I learn the more the more interesting the picture becomes. And I, so there's I, a related go sorry. ahead. Yes. I was just gonna say the elephant in the room. Um, when it comes to, I know there's a lot of great questions, like why don't we have a vaccine and why don't we have better treatments? And I think it, most people here will agree the elephant in the room is UTI is primarily a female problem. Um, and there is very, if you think about it, when we look about, when we think about all the funding that is available to us, it is very limited. Um, and for someone who has been trying for years, I mean, I know it looks like we're successful, but that's probably because we've been applying so many different places and trying to make a case um, and many people lose hope so I think people who could have devoted time and effort to this lose hope because there just aren't enough opportunities um, and part of why I'm so grateful to the NIDDK and Caribou is to have this opportunity to devote my time and effort to UTIs. So I, I, there's a there's a related question in the in the chat about um, 
you know, diagnostics, for example. And Angie Duggar uh, wants to ask thoughts on PCR DNA testing over culture at the clinical level, whether they be PCR based or perhaps some type of metagenomics based, um, and then whether or not there are treatment options beyond IV antibiotics, the power, power antibiotics or bladder installations. Um, and I think we could probably open that to our, our clinicians that are on the panel today as well, first. Go ahead, Sonali. Um, I think I can answer. Um, in general, I think some of the molecular diagnostics have not been incorporated into um, many hospitals. They're expensive. I don't know if insurance companies will cover them. And so there's a lot of logistical challenges on sample collection as well. Um, can the hospital afford to have the infrastructure? Can your insurance company... Um, reimburse you for it. So I think there's there's several challenges when it comes to that. And I will let the other um, colleagues talk more about what other issues there are or how can we leverage it. I know that several companies are working on PCR technologies, um, especially point of care, as well as um, integrated technologies. In terms of treatments, you know, I as a clinician, I can tell you, I've not had as much of a problem with having available therapies for, like I, it is very rare that I come across a case that I don't have an antibiotic to treat. I think the challenge what we're doing is we have something for the organism, but we don't focus so much on the symptom, the underlying symptoms. So it may be that we need something separate to relieve the symptoms while we're working on clearing the infection. So I think some of that is related to what is our end goal of treatment? Um, one avenue that is progressing tremendously is phage therapies. And I think it is promising. Again, it's still pretty new. And I think using phage for some of these very drug resistant organisms might be an avenue. And they can, phage is usually either administered IV and bladder installation or just bladder installation and still in clinical trials. So I would say it's gonna take some time for us to find out. Yeah, I think there's some like there's a lot of logistics at, at play for why some, you know, new therapies might not be common right now. Like with phage therapy, for example, there's, you know, you can't just have we don't you have phage that can just kill all the bacteria that will cause a UTI. They're actually very specific, right? For even specific strains of like the same species of of a bacterium. So usually those are things that have to be almost personalized. Like we, you have to send the sample uh, with the urine to a facility to be tested to see if they have a phage that can act against it. And then there's a lag in treatment, right? So in order for those things to work, right, you have to be able to manage the symptoms some other way too, because again, if you treat with antibiotics, there's not enough bacteria and actually the phage don't work as well. If there's not a lot of bacteria, they work much better when the bacteria are very actively dividing and stuff. So, you know, there's so many of these like kind of logistical challenges and it really takes a lot of like money and trials to figure out a way around them and investment. And, you know, we have an issue with um, infectious disease in general, where, you know, pharmaceutical companies don't really want to invest, right? And, and that's why we're trying to think of like non-antibiotic solutions because, and new antibiotics aren't being developed at the rate they need to be developed. And I think that's why a lot of clinicians really worry uh, about, you know, the antimicrobial resistance uh, and things like that. Uh, and so if we can, you know, treat the symptoms, right? Which is something, you know, I, I think makes sense. Um, and then figure out the best way to actually treat the, the, the cause or actually find out the cause, right? We don't, might not even know. Cause like you might have a bacterial infection and it might, you know, but it might not be treatable with the antibiotic that you would be given because we might not even know how to treat that bacteria because bacteria are weird and they all do different things, right? So, um, yeah, so I guess, I, I, I don't know if I was supposed to answer something else, but that's... Uh... No, this, is, this is really helpful. Um, and I think we were, your points about phage are are well taken. 
Yeah. I mean, it's, it's challenges that like can be overcome, but we just need to work together to figure it out. And we need like, I mean, uh, it comes down to needing the money to do that. Right. Like, cause the money, money is time. If the more time we can spend on things, if we can, and, and all the resources that you need to actually make these discoveries. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, um, it's, it's challenging and I understand the patient's frustration for sure. We have a very specific question from Heather Pitcher in the uh, in the in the chat that says, uh, "Can Canada Candida, as in the the, fun, uh, the fungi, uh, can Candida overgrowth be associated with or even cause UTIs? Would this cause a negative test result? Do we know much about Candida in uh, in UTIs? We we have a reasonable amount of data on." Yeah. Candidus. And again, it, it, this is a very broad question. Like I said, I always prefer not to answer an all or none. And it's a nuanced answer. So in general, candida does not cause UTIs. But in someone who has instrumentation of the urinary tract, or is a very immunocompromised patient, so whose immune system is very weak because of a transplant, or, you know, they have, they're um, a bone marrow transplant patient, or they're um, someone with a who's a neonate, like a baby, Candida can cause a UTI. Um, I personally don't know of data that shows that presence of candida can lead to um, issues with bacterial growth. Um, so I have not found that data, but I would say generally, unless you're, you have some reason to like have a candida infection. So most times we're colonized with candida. And so that might be growing in the culture. Now, I also want to make sure my colleague, um, Ava, chimes in. Just think, another clinician on the call. Just want to make sure. Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. I think, you know, I don't, I don't think that it would lead to negative results. It may on a urinalysis because it's not going to show up like one would expect for E. coli, for example. Um, but, you know, for urine culture to grow out yeast, or you know, candida. Um, as as Sonali mentioned, you know, you could have an infection. One would think maybe it's representative of maybe some um, you know vaginal yeast infection as well. Um, but you know, the treatment would essentially be the same. And and yeast infections do ca can cause urinary symptoms as well. And so I wouldn't be surprised if if it if it, it grew in the urine. Um, yeah. That's that would be my thinking if I saw that in clinic, um, but you're there are many surprises in clinic. You know, someone shows up and you 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 see a, a urinalysis and you're like, oh, it doesn't show any uh, nitrites, probably not E. coli. But you know, and of course, clinicians are very bad at following any guidelines, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, and lo and behold, it it grows proteus, and then you're like, oh, I, I didn't think to treat it or. So, you know, clinicians are sort of stumped with the tools that we have and, and getting to point of care testing, I think that would be really helpful because the tools that we have are very limited to the organ to the most common organisms. Um, and whether or not metagenomics testing would be helpful, I mean, this again has to do with what might be present in the urine and, and Sonali's point of, you know, symptoms. Uh, and that and that spectrum of of presence of bacteria in the urine, and I think if one were to use metagenomics to identify UTI, I think there would need to be a lot of studies to actually be able to say what what profile might lead a clinician to treat it as a UTI. Um, there, UCSF has the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub where actually uh, Chaz Langerunia, who's this um, metagenomics expert, expert uh, you know, uses uh, these methods to identify organisms in um, harder to identify infections, um, like, uh, you know, someone coming in with a potential meningitis and, and trying to identify what organism might be causing, uh, causing that in using cerebral uh, spinal fluid. Um, and I've, I've seen him apply that to um, bronchial alveolar lavages as well to identify causes of uh, pneumonia. But uh, I would be, 
there would be a lot of samples to process if it were to be urine. Well, I think the issue with like the metagenomic or PCR based approaches is like, you know, if you're looking at cerebral spinal fluid, like you, you know, if there's bacteria there, it's not supposed to be there, right? But there's a microbiome in the bladder, in the vagina, right? So the thing is, we don't know what's good and what's bad at this point. And we don't even know necessarily if all E. coli are good or all E. coli are, are bad uh, to say, right? Because some patients have ASB, right? Um, or, you know, whatever that actual categorization is. And then the other issue is that right now there are at least with metagenomics um, and, and you know, those kind of Illumina-based or even the nanopore-based sequencing approaches, they're not point of care. I mean, the, you know, there are papers that claim they can be done in four hours and like I, we do those all the time and I don't believe that <laughs> because, or it's be very expensive because the way that you do it, you would be spending like a thousand dollars per sample, which I don't think is something that is, you know, super feasible to do. And, and, you know, so best case, maybe it would be six hours, if not longer. And if you do that, then, then you're not point of care anymore, right? Like the patient's gone home. <laughs> um, I don't know, like it, point of care means right within the office visit. Um, and so I think that's the challenge there. And I, I don't really know how we can move that technology to be necessarily, um, you know, point of care. Um, it's, it's great. And we use it all the time. That's how we do our microbiome research. But it's kind of crazy to me to think that it could be point of care. So we have one interesting question in the chat, and I think we'll probably end on this one um, from Dr. Farhat that says any comment or pointer on from the panelists on UTI in children where uh, symptoms might be difficult to express and the method of urine collection might be difficult. Um, how about um, Eva? <laughs> um, yeah, I, that's an excellent question. It's UTI in children are difficult, you know, you will, and, and Sonali as an infectious disease expert, you probably, you know, think about this as well. I, although I don't know if you see kids, but uh, well, in family medicine, we end up seeing kids. So, you know, you, you usually will be a kid coming in with a fever and so they'll have symptoms. And in that case, if they're growing something in their urine, you will end up, you know, treating them for it. And I agree that getting urine from a, a child and send for urine culture is, is quite complicated. Um, there's been this interesting study that came out of Stanford that showed that um, discordant antibiotic therapy, so pr essentially prescribing the wrong antibiotic, uh, made no difference in terms of children's UTIs getting better. Now, I, I don't remember if the paper differentiated between kids coming in septic or not. Obviously, I think one would probably have to be very careful with that. But uh, for uncomplicated cystitis, it sounded like even prescribing whatever antibiotic, even if the organism is resistant to it, it was just as fine. Um, but yeah, if there were, I don't think that there's enough research in children, even though, I mean, just, just like for women, unfortunately. I think the only thing I would add to that, so I don't see patients clinically. Um, I mean, I don't see children um, in a clinical setting. Um, but one of the things that I was, I started to notice when I was implementing some programs is younger children or, or children who can't express had some of the same challenges as the older adults that I focus on in my research. You know, it's like we come across scenarios where it's the caregiver kind of giving you this sense of like something is wrong you know, they can't tell you, but something is wrong. And over time, you refine your ability to communicate with people. And, and admittedly, I, I feel like I have time to do this. Most people in practice are so busy, like they have so many back-to-back -back patients, they don't have the time to take an intense history and physical exam um, because of the panel that they're following. And so if you have the time, sometimes you can get a good history. Data has shown that in children, pyuria is a better predictor. So presence of white cells in the urine is a better predictor of UTI than in older, uh, sorry, than in adults or older adults. So that is a good marker. Um, and then even urine thresholds are lower in children. So we generally use a threshold of 100,000. That's a debate for another day. 
and I'm more than happy to talk about that. But in children, the, the AAP says it's a threshold of 50,000. So there are some nuances. Well, I think we can wrap it up here. I think this has been a really excellent discussion and um, you know, a great community to bring together to kind of put scientists in front of the people who we are serving as, as a community. Um, I want to remind everyone that uh, you know Caribou really did a great job in bringing this together, and they're going to continue bringing uh, bringing us all together so that we can continue these conversations. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here so much. Thank you to our panelists, and we'll wrap up for the day. Thank you, everyone.